Good evening. Looks like people are just kicking in, so we'll give it just a moment. Good evening and welcome to the second webinar in a three part series of parenting. A whole new world parenting during a pandemic brought to you by the Hemophilia Federation of America's Family Families Program. I'm Carrie Koenig, Program Director at HFA. Also on the line, we have Anne Lewa, VP of Education at HFA and Dr. Juliana Bloom. Tonight's webinar will focus on parenting school age children. Just a few helpful hints before we get started. We've allotted approximately one hour for tonight's webinar. We certainly welcome and request audience participation and engagement. However, your audio will be muted for the duration of the webinar presentation by our system. It helps eliminate some of that background noise. We look forward to your participation. And if you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please utilize the chat or the Q&A tool at the bottom of your control panel. We will then pass your questions on to Dr. Bloom. All of our parenting webinars will be recorded and posted on HFA's YouTube channel for future reference. And as I see people are starting to hop in, I'm gonna upgrade you to a panelist so you're able to share video and also um, discuss some concerns perhaps with Dr. Bloom towards the end of the presentation. But for the duration of the presentation, we will keep your line muted. I'm just promoting some folks here. Okay. We would like to take a moment to thank Takeda, CVS Health, Novo Nordisk, and Genentech for funding our families program. Without their generous donations, this webinar and our series of webinars would not be possible. Today's presentation, A Whole New World, Parenting in a Pandemic, we have a very knowledgeable speaker, Dr. Juliana Bloom. Based in Orlando, Florida, Dr. Bloom is a licensed psychologist and pediatric neuropsychologist. She received her BA, summa cum laude, from Emory University and both her Master's of Education and Doctorate from the University of Georgia. While at the University of Georgia, she conducted clinical research on the neurobiological basis of dyslexia and ADHD. Dr. Bloom completed her internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where she worked with children and adolescents with complex medical and neurological illnesses, including stroke, epilepsy, brain tumors, cancer, blood disorders, and traumatic brain injury. Dr. Bloom's areas of clinical interest include dyslexia, ADHD, neuropsychological outcomes, and school reentry following acquired brain injury and medical illnesses, and medical trauma, oh, I'm sorry, medical traumatic stress in patients and families. She's the author of seven peer reviewed journal articles, six invited book chapters, and more than 40 conference presentations. She's a member of the American Psychological Association and the International Neuropsychological Society. She loves spending her free time with her husband and her two children. Advance slide, please. Next slide. We just want to remind everyone that this webinar is for educational purposes only and not intended to be construed as medical advice or the official opinion or position of HFA, its staff, or its board of directors. Attendees are strongly encouraged to discuss their own medical treatments with their healthcare providers. And with that, we can get started and I will turn it over to Dr. Bloom. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Carrie. It has been um, an absolute pleasure to um, work with you guys and to be able to present to this group. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. I wanted to mention um, that not only am I a pediatric neuropsychologist, but um, I also have a child with a chronic medical illness. And so um, I'm a parent of an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and my eight-year-old has celiac disease. I know it is not the same as hemophilia, but I do know a bit about what it's like to be a parent of a child um, with a disorder that's not really well understood and that needs to be managed on, on the constant basis. 
um, and be thought about every day. So I want you to know I do have that perspective, although I appreciate the differences as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about parenting during this difficult time. This is a challenging time for us all. And I think many of us felt like Mary Poppins on day one, but we're feeling a bit like Mrs. Hannigan now. So I really liked um, that particular uh, slide. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, there are times that I'm approaching this and I'm thinking, I really love having all this time with my kids and we're getting to do these new experiences together. And then there are times that I'm thinking, give me some space immediately before I end up in an asylum. And that is kind of how parenting in a pandemic feels. I also like the name of this uh, blogger, Goldfish and Chicken Nuggets. That could also be um, you know, the name of my blog if I had one. So I wanna talk a little bit about why this is so hard because parenting right now really is so hard. Um, we have never done anything like this before. The last pandemic occurred in 1918, 1919, and um, it was a, there's very few people who have, I don't think there's anyone who has a memory of that. Very few people were alive in the last one. Um, and so it's not something we can look to and you know, look to ask our parents, how did you handle this at this phase in your life, or talk to our friends about, this is brand new for everybody. And everybody is figuring out what to do. I'm talking down from our toddlers all the way up to um, our teachers, to us, to the grandparents, to people who are in charge and running things. No one has known, has done this before. And so everybody is feeling things out and figuring things out. Um, also, the whole world is experiencing this at once. So I live in Florida, we have hurricanes, and when a hurricane hits, it usually only hits one part of Florida, and then the rest of Florida and the rest of the United States will come in and help. We cannot help each other right now, even regionally. Um, you know, if there's wildfires or if there's an earthquake, um, that is something, you know, different people are affected, we can gather resources from unaffected places and help one another. That's not something we can do right now. Um, we also don't have much perspective of this. Um, we don't have a good sense of when it's going to end, how long it's going to last, what things are going to be like. We can't answer basic questions. Um, you know, um, school ends, this is our last week of school, and we're thinking to ourselves, what is summer going to look like? We, we honestly don't know. We certainly don't know what fall is going to look like. Um, it's difficult for, so all of that, the challenges with all of that, um, kids are experiencing this in another way. They've lost their structure. They've lost their routine. Um, they are losing their chance to have the education that they need to have. They miss their friends. They miss their coaches and their teachers. It's important for kids to have other adults in their life besides their parents. Um, and kids, you know, they don't have those challenges to overcome and they don't have that level of independence. So, um, you know, my son used to bike himself to school, it's about a mile, and he would bike himself back and forth every day. And he doesn't get to do that. He doesn't get to really be alone right now. Um, and that's hard for, for all of us. Um, that level of independence and those missed ceremonies, like um, I was just talking to somebody who, um, the, the play, the school play was set to happen on, I think, March 20th and she was the lead in the play. And so her daughter had been so excited about this opportunity and it was just taken away from her right before the end. And certainly with graduation ceremonies and proms and all of those things, a lot of kids are really missing on those life cycle events. Um, so talking about the parents, we're normally the ones who help our kids and we are stretched right now far beyond our own capacity. Um, and that is even if things are as good as they can be. So a big shout out to all of the essential workers, certainly everyone working in a hospital setting on the front lines of this illness or working in a grocery store or, you know, whatever the case may be, you have separate concerns, you have your own concerns. Um, and it's very, very difficult without the, that kind of support and being challenged at this time, especially if you also have kids at home who are not able to go to school. Um, even if you are lucky enough to have a job where you can work from home, you're trying to work from home at the same time that you are trying to um, teach to homeschool for the first time and manage everybody's emotions. And um, I don't know about you guys, but the first couple of weeks setting up the technology of all the distance learning was very challenging. Um, it's a very difficult, difficult thing to go through. And in the beginning, there was a lot of adrenaline 
but I think that that is kind of wearing down right now. So everybody is stretched way too thin. Parents are stretched way too thin. One of the things that I think is interesting is that a lot of people who are single or retire or their kids are out of the house or didn't have kids, they are bored. I think that all of us can say, we are not bored. We are very, very busy. We are overstretched. We are overtaxed. There are more laundry than before. There's more dishes than before. Gosh, so many dishes. So we're all stretched far beyond our own capacity. So a reminder that what we're being asked to do is not humanly possible. It does, if you are either a working parent or a stay-at-home parent or you work part-time, working, parenting, and teaching are all three different jobs that can't be done at the same time. And managing a house is a job in and of itself. So if you feel like you're doing everything badly right now, that's because it's too much, you know, and we all just really have to do the best that we can. I really like this particular meme because it says, when you have to choose, because at some point you will, you're gonna have to choose, try to choose connection. Um, don't argue about the academic assignment, try to play a game with your kid. Um, try to do, the ta do a chore with them rather than being angry that they're not helping. Sometimes just don't worry about it all and just snuggle on the couch and watch a movie. Um, there are, it, it is okay because right now it's all too much and we really do have to lower our expectations of what we're gonna be able to do in order to get through this time and survive it. Okay, so talking a bit about what we know. So we really don't have a lot of research on the effects of a global pandemic on children. Nobody was really doing research at the time of the last one. Um, there have been, there has been some research coming out of China, which had a very different system than ours um, in terms of how they manage the virus. Um, in their case, if, uh, if there was an affected family member, that family member was removed from the home. So the child could have been removed from the home or the parent removed from the home. So a lot of those kids had a very high level of stress um, because of that removal. But we know some studies about quarantine for other illness is that just quarantining itself is linked with post-traumatic stress, symptoms, confusion, and anger. Um, and you feel for yourself, you feel for your loved ones, you, especially those essential workers and people who are vulnerable. And we're talking for you guys, you know, you have a member of your family who um, is, has a medical illness and that you're worried about, can you manage this? Um, economic and financial worries, I think, are absolutely huge right now. Um, everybody is struggling with that what, and with the uncertainty of it. So people have loss of income, loss of health insurance, um, difficulty getting unemployment, um, reduction in hours. Um, there's a lot of things that are very challenging at this particular time. Um, add on to all of that, homeschooling. I don't think that's saying I mean, some people were homeschooled before and probably better prepared for this. But for many of us, we, we did not have experience with that and maybe don't feel like we're very well suited to it, but we're in a position where we have to do it. So really kids need more from their life than we can get in one household. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why quarantine is so difficult. They need a certain level of exercise. They need to be learning and growing and doing. They need friendships. Um, and those are all things that's very hard to do when you are stuck inside your house. So emerging research, about a quarter of children in China showed symptoms of traumatic stress. So that's a very, very high number. Um, I talked about why it might be higher there than it is here, but I, certainly we are hearing of a huge increase in anxiety, in um, sleep difficulties, in depressive disorders in kids. We don't have the research at this point to say that this is definitively happening, but just in terms of what I am hearing, I think, and I'm sure what you guys are hearing, there seems to be a lot more than there used to be. So what we're seeing a lot are clinginess, distractibility, irritability, and fear of asking questions about the epidemic. Maybe they don't want to know what's going to be happening. Wanting, that's avoiding. Um, fearing for yourself or for loved ones. That's a big fear as well. Um, one of my friends said that her son really doesn't want her to do anything because he's so scared that she would die of the virus, even though she's not at risk. But that's just how some kids are feeling. Okay, so this is very fun. This is um, during about the second week of this, um, my friend Erin sent me this that her son had written. It's one of those poems, you know, goes by the letter. So it, he made a poem on Corona, misspelled, but that's okay. And he writes, Corona is the worst. 
oh, so many people are sick. Red is the color of it, no and awful. Okay, so talking specifically about the impacts on families who are living with hemophilia, um, what I'm hearing from Carrie and Anne is the biggest thing that you guys are worried about right now is the financial stressors. Um, losing jobs, losing insurance, particularly losing insurance because you need to have access to your treatments and you want to make sure that um, that continues. That's very important. So the financial aspect of it and the health insurance aspect of it. Um, if that is a concern, that is a big whopping concern and that just kind of sits there. Um, in terms of being worried about the disease and the impact on it with um, COVID-19, what I understand so far from the medical doctors, which I am not one, is that there is not really worry that this is going to be um, a higher impact. If someone with hemophilia happens to get um, COVID, they should do just as well. However, um, there's a couple exceptions to that. There's the people who are on the inhibitors who um, have some immune suppression, so that's a concern for them. So actually staying away from this disease, being very careful about that. And the other thing is that when you have a child with a chronic illness, and I do understand what this feels like, hospitalization is just more complicated. You can't count on the, the doctor who walks in the door to really understand, um, and you need to be there to advocate. And so there's that concern that if my child or if I or my father or whoever happen to get um, you know, COVID that and need to be hospitalized, that the treatment wouldn't um, be what it needs to be for the hemophilia and take that into account. So things get a little bit more complicated. There's also always just that little additional bit of stress. One of the things that I want to talk about is um, the grief. So I think a way that people who are, are generally, you know, at home, not so affected, haven't lost a family member, not an essential worker, we are still grieving. Um, and the reason for that is that we feel that all of a sudden the world has changed and there's this kind of anticipation of what's gonna happen. We don't know what's gonna happen. Um, uncertainty is very bad. Our mind knows deep down that something bad is happening, but we also can't see it. And so kind of the sense of safety and social order that's so important for us um, has been lost. So just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11, Things will change from here on out. And this is the point at which they changed. So the loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection, it's hitting us and we're grieving. I don't know about you guys, but I could feel it in the air, you know, those first few weeks. Um, you know, you go outside and, and things felt very, very different. Um, now I feel it in a different way. I feel a tension and an uncertainty as things are starting to open up. Um, an uncertainty about what's safe, anger between other people about do they're not engaging in a safe behavior versus this is not a necessary behavior. Um, a lot of people that, that anger is becoming real. And, the, and I think that comes from fear because you don't know exactly what's going to pan out and you don't know exactly how to behave in this brand new situation. And that does have a lot of fear. And for a lot of people, fear turns into anger. So this, by the way, this conceptualization is what's happening is being grief is from David Kessler, who worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on the stages of grief. So these are the stages of grief. And it's one of the things that I really want to show you guys because um, you may see some of these things happening in your own household with your children or with yourself. And if you do, that is something that is important to be aware of. Um, and that you don't go through them in progressive order. You go through them, um, you can bounce back and forth, hopefully ending on acceptance. But denial, bargaining, anger, depression, acceptance. And I think that um, one important thing to understand, we know what most of these look like. Depression is not just sadness. Sadness is a symptom of depression. But you don't actually have to be experiencing sadness in order to be depressed. Um, the main symptom of depression is something called anhedonia which is a lack of interest in things or lack of pleasure in things that you used to take pleasure from. So just kind of feeling nothing, that's a symptom of depression. Um, what I'm seeing a lot is a bit of withdrawal and I don't feel like doing anything. And that could be signs of depression. Now that can be, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a major depressive disorder that needs to be treated until 
you've had those symptoms and they're interfering with your functioning for two straight weeks. So if it's been two straight weeks and you or your child are having those symptoms, it's time to seek some help. But it's normal during this time, during a period of grief, to have some of this, you know, to have a few days where you feel like that and then maybe you feel better for a few days and then you have a couple other few days where you feel like that. And as long as it's not getting in, interfering with your functioning too, too much, then that is something that will probably resolve with time. But do know that, you know, if it's been two weeks and it's interfering with you getting stuff done, then, um, then it's time to, time to seek some help. Another way to think of this, and, and I'm kind of splitting it up into those of us who have not been too terribly effective, affected by the pandemic, just in terms of, you know, where life has changed, but, you know, we haven't lost a loved one or been hospitalized ourselves. Um, I think those of us are having the grief. I think for people who are on the front lines, who are um, dealing with this every day, worrying about this every day, particularly those doctors and nurses and hospital staff who are coming into contact with the virus every day, this would be considered to be acute stress. So there's a part of our brain deep down inside called the amygdala, and it is responsible for our flight or fight response. Um, fight. I believe we're having some technical difficulties. If you would just hang tight for just a minute, we'll see what we can um, adjust here. Hi. Hi, I'm back. Well, isn't that a little fun adventure? Sorry about that, everybody. No worries. It happened to me a couple times today. So oh, good. is everybody having a oh no, try to do this? Everybody having thunderstorms? Okay, I should be sharing again. Are we back? You're back and look <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for your patience with that. Okay. Um so I was, this was not the slide I was on. I was on this one. Okay. So when we have a, we're talking about the amygdala deep inside the brain. When we have a really stressful event, um, there's a huge amount of adrenaline and cortisol, which are kind of our activating hormones that make us go, 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 give us energy. Um, so that if we were being chased by a lion, we would run really fast, as fast as we possibly could. That's really, really helpful short term if you're being chased by a lion. Um, is that the threat continues to be there and life continues to be different and the um and but chronic anxiety if you stay in that elevated state for too long we were never meant to be in that elevated state for very long so that chronic anxiety is really harmful to the body and to the mind overall a little bit of anxiety is really useful right now it keeps you safe um, it keeps you washing your hands. It keeps you doing all the things that you need to do in order to protect yourself and your kids. Um, I connected to my hotspot, so hopefully I won't lose it this time because I'm connected to my cell phone. So hopefully we're good for a little while. Um, overall, the adrenaline is going to wear off after a while. And that's when kind of you end up in that lower energy state, a little more lethargy and depression. So, but as the anxiety is really up, 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 you have some physical symptoms that you can have. And some of those even kind of mimic um, what, you know, the symptoms of coronavirus are. So in the first few weeks, people were saying, oh, I'm really lightheaded. I have a headache. I'm feeling weak. Um, you know, I'm feeling like my heart is racing all the time. And in that case, you know, um, it's actually those hormones, those stress hormones that are taking over. So knowing what's going on with that is really helpful and important. Um, mental symptoms of being under a huge amount of stress include, you know, chronic worry, being distractible, having trouble sleeping, and being restless. 
So there is a lot going on that's just happening in your brain that then affects um, your mood, your thoughts, and your body. So after um, about 30 days of this, we kind of moved into a different stage. So some people had moved on to coping pretty well, and some people were still having um, symptoms um, of traumatic stress. And traumatic stress is something that can happen after a stressful event. It can happen um, in a medical situation. Um, if, you know, certainly parents watching their children in a medical situation or watching a parent or a spouse. Um, and the symptoms of traumatic stress are re-experiencing avoidance and hyperarousal. So that hyperarousal is that difficulty sleeping and being restless, keyed up, on edge, distractible. Um, the avoidance is not wanting to talk about it, um, avoiding situations that remind you of it, um, saying, you know, like, like my daughter has said a couple of times, I don't want to leave the house because I don't want to catch coronavirus and us trying to then talk to her about this is how we cope with it, this is how we do it. Um, and the symptoms of re-experiencing um, would be, you know, having dreams, bad dreams. So I think that's happening a lot for people. And you can have these symptoms and not be, not have PTSD full blown. So it doesn't have to be full blown disorder. It's, it's normal to have some of these experiences at a bit of a sub, subclinical level. And it's important to recognize that the traumatic event can also be ongoing. So it's not like, um, it's, it's not like you're in a situation where um, the traumatic event is, is happening all at once. You can have a little bits of the traumatic event over time. And I think what's happening for a lot of people is this is just wearing on people at this point. Hold on, I just wanna check and make sure. All right, that I've got what I need in order to be able to keep us going. Okay, so, um, okay, next part. All right, so one way that I think is really helpful to think about this is the survival brain versus the learning brain. So we're being asked to educate our children and that is really challenging when you have this survival brain that has been activated. So the amygdala is down there and it's just lighten up all the time. And the part of the brain that needs learning is that prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, those two areas that are highlighted there. So the prefrontal cortex is kind of like your executive system. It's what helps your kid um, stay organized, stay on top of things, manage their emotions, Okay, and that kind of get turned off when the amygdala is overactive. It's like a magnet that does the opposite. So it pushes that away um, and makes that less active when the amygdala is active. The hippocampus um, is your memory area of your brain. And the amygdala can, can either act to make your memories much stronger or it can act to make your memories much less. So usually it makes your memories not as good. So it's much more difficult to lay down new memories when you're in a state of high stress and when your amygdala is activated. So, and it's also hard to make good decisions and manage your emotions. So I don't know if that helps you understand kind of maybe what your children have been going through, but when you look at it in the brain, you can see, well, that amygdala has been really firing for every member of the family. And it's made us not use our prefrontal cortex as much, not use our good decision maker, our thinker. And it's also made it harder for us to learn and remember new things at a time when we're being asked to learn and remember a huge amount. Another thing to think about is, you know, this is not normal. This is an adverse childhood event. So an adverse childhood event is a frequent, chronic, uncontrolled, toxic stressor. Kids have them all the time. They're things like divorce, um, moving, a chronic illness, a major hospitalization. Now, sometimes it can be good to have stressors in your life. They can teach resilience and coping skills, especially when the parents help out. But if you have a huge amount of these, you know, poverty, racism, those are other ones. Um, if you have many of them, it really changes how your genes are expressed. So if you have four or more in a lifespan, it can really lead to poor medical outcomes. So for example, four or more leads to a higher incidence of heart disease, and it doesn't matter what the diet and exercise habits are. It is really just about that stress on your body is a major, major um, force for heart disease as you get older. So like I said, this is an ACE. It's important to think about it like that, but it doesn't mean that, um, this can't be used, it really depends on how this happens. 
So it depends on how this plays out, how the parents facilitate. Um, and some stress can be good when you, you have some coping responses and some resiliency that the, the parent helps out with. Um, factors that mitigate ACEs, if you have good nutrition, if you get exercise, um, if you have few other stressors and if you have good relationships, that really seems to help a great deal. So one thing I'll say is that relationship right now is very supportive, um, very important. You want to really focus with your kids on being as warm and supportive as you can. Now, you're being asked to do that at a time when your stress is at an all-time high. So what I'll say is this, don't multitask um, as best you can. I know that that's a hard thing to do, but make sure that there's at least some time when your kid has your undivided attention and that you're being supportive, you're being warm, you're responding to them, you give it eye contact and you have some playtime with them on a daily basis. Something that they direct that you don't necessarily direct. And what I'll say about that is that research shows that you don't need to have a huge amount of that. So that seems overwhelming what I just asked you to do, but if I also tell you that you only need to spend 15 minutes doing it, then it seems a lot more doable, okay? So having that connection time where you're really attending, they have your undivided attention and responding to the words and gestures will make a huge amount of difference in behavior because um, discipline really occurs through your relationship with your kid. And if you're feeling very connected, if your kid's feeling very connected to you, they're much more likely to listen to you. If they're feeling disconnected to you, then behavior kind of goes out the window. So investing in a little bit of what they call special time, 15 minutes a day with each child, can really pay off in the long run. Um, and it really is child dependent on what they wanna do with you. And, and, but it should be something that they lead on. Um, the other thing that you wanna think about is building up those resilience skills. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you do that. And then the other concept to think on is, what is it that your child can control? So, so much is out of control in everyone's life. Um, and you want to think about it, what are some things that they can control? So as you plan, your, maybe as you plan your daily schedule, or maybe as you're planning your meals for the week, um, think about are there some things that your child can have some control over, build those autonomy and independent skills, because that goes a long way towards fulfilling their emotional needs. So kids really need to have a coach that's going to help them through this. Um, they really need their parents more than ever for that perspective that this will, you know, this will end eventually, we're going to be okay, um, and modeling of how to handle it. So what you don't have to do is you don't have to pretend everything is okay and, um, and totally have it together because that actually really won't help your kid. This is not the time to, to you know, not show them emotions and be strong in front of them. Um, that it is really okay right now for you to have, you know, to cry on the couch and to, and to share with your kids how you're feeling. You know, these are school-aged kids, they can handle it. Um, they want, what they want to see, what they really need is a model of paying attention to those emotions, being aware of them, talking about them, asking for help with them if you need to, and working on your own emotions, using coping skills. So if you're having a really bad day, if it's tough, it is really helpful, actually, good modeling to say to your kids, I am feeling really sad and down today. This whole pandemic has got me confused and I'm scared about the future. I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but, and I just wanna, can I get a hug? And they will come and they'll give you a hug and then you can talk about the, you know, I feel sad, but this is what I'm gonna do to handle it. I'm gonna remember the things that are positive. I'm gonna remember the things that I have to be grateful for. And I'm gonna remember that we're gonna to be together and make these decisions together. And I'm gonna remember the things I have control over. So what I'm talking about doing here with that modeling is really, this is, this is not just letting off steam, okay? So, you know, we hear a lot about, okay, okay, moms and dads, go get some self-care, um, take a bath, you know, get a facial. Um, have a night out with the girls. This is, that's all fine. That kind of releases the pressure valve a little bit. What I'm talking about is actually making the container bigger so that it can handle more pressure. And those are those, um, this is not just about self-care. This is about having more emotional resiliency, modeling that for your kids and teaching those skills to them directly. Okay, so how are kids reacting to this? 
So for school age kids, um, which are the age of my kids, so you might get to hear some about my kids, um, children are, they have, they understand feelings, but they might be still developing insight into their feelings. Like they might not recognize that when they're really frustrated, that comes from what they're frustrated about. Um, they might not want to be sad. They might not realize that when they're, you know, when they're angry, they're feeling really angry, but that's covering up the sadness. So, and many of them can't communicate those feelings well. So they can't necessarily come up and say to you, I'm sad. They might instead hit their brother. Um, and that might be how they're communicating with. So you want to think of the behaviors that you see as communication. So a kid having trouble sleeping is probably having some significant anxiety, and that's important to, to recognize. Um, things that we're seeing a lot of in my clinical practice, and I'm certainly hearing from, from the community, is um, sadness and withdrawal. Um, so there are some kids who just don't feel like getting off the couch. There are some kids who um, you know, don't want to um, really participate in doing very much right now. They're just kind of numbing out. Um, some kids are very clingy. Um, a lot of kids are showing a major regression in their skills, possibly sleeping. Um, behavior, you know, kind of not listening, being easily frustrated, um, irritability, anxiety and sleep are very big. Um, I think part of the sleep problem is that the, the day doesn't have the same level of activity that it did before. Um, and, you know, certainly for kids who are like on sports teams um, or spent a long time in a dance studio, they aren't getting that level of exercise. I mean, you might be exercising with them, but it is, you know, making sure that they get out, run around, ride bikes, whatever the case might be. But it is hard to replace the amount of exercise and stimulation um, that they would have been getting in school. Um, one thing I want to mention, because this is very true in my house and people are talking about it, is Zoom fatigue. So I think that there are some kids who do well with this online learning, um, particularly, you know, among our school age group, we're talking, you know, roughly about five to 12. Um, but, you know, a five-year-old's capacity to really engage with what's going on in a Zoom classroom meeting is very different than a 12-year-old's capacity. And even the 12-year-olds are getting, um, having difficulty with it after a period of time. I mean, we're talking about Zoom fatigue in adults. Um, we're talking about the fact that, you know, having meeting after meeting after meeting on Zoom is really not something that adults are having an easy time with. But I think that the younger school age kids really just can't do this. Um, maybe a few of them can, but I'm hearing a lot of people saying that, no, they just, you know, can't engage in these kinds of activities very well. Um, so like I said, think of the behavior that you're seeing as a communication. Think about the feeling that's underlying that behavior and then see what we can do to address that feeling. So this is my example of clinginess. Um, so this is our poor dog who's basic, and my son obviously reading on the ground, um, who is basically our poor dog has been a pillow um, for about the past, you know, however many weeks it's been, close to 10 now. Um, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, I really didn't used to snuggle her before. You know, they would play with her sometimes, they'd pet her, but they didn't, you know, use her as a pillow constantly. And right now they're, they're very clingy and they're, they're clinging to her a lot. They're also clinging to me a lot more. Um, so if you're seeing some of that, that is something to be, you know, that's very understandable. Um, sadness about this and grief and loss may look different than you expect. It can look like anger. It can look like I'm not down with this schedule. This is not okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not complying with a new order. It can look like tiredness. Remember we talked about kind of that anhedonia and depression. Um, numbing out. So sometimes, you know, in order to kind of stop that amygdala from going into overdrive and taking over your brain, you just kind of have to numb out for a while. Um, displaced frustration. And I really think I'm bored is code for I'm sad. And um, it's really hard. It's really hard um, to work through boredom for kids. I do think it's good for kids to work through boredom. They have toys. They can, they can entertain themselves. But sometimes what they're also saying is I'm really needing time to connect with you. Um, I certainly notice it more when I'm working than on times that I'm able to spend more time with them in terms of the boredness and the sadness. Um, so for children, they're dealing with a complete disruption in their routine that they didn't even see coming. 
you know, we had been hearing news stories and stuff, but, um, and I think I had talked to my kids about washing their hands a little bit more, but it really seemed to come out of nowhere for kids. All of a sudden their life was one way and then it was not that way. Their parents are emotional, their parents are worried, their parents are stressed, their parents are cranky. Um, they have separation from some caregivers, teachers, grandparents that they really love, that they really wanna spend time with and they, that they can't. Um, also, kids don't have that same sense of how big the world is. You remember when you were a kid, how long it would take to get from one birthday to the next one or from Christmas to you know the start of school, it seemed like forever. Um, and as adults, it goes so fast. This time is lasting much longer for them. Time speeds up as you get older. Um, they're also, kids, you know, their developmental goal is to grow up, to achieve more, to become more independent, to learn new things. And they're in a place where they really can't do that. They're stuck at home and it's hard for them to be more independent when their parents are right there. Um, teachers always give um, children more independence than their parents do. So we can expect some regression. And what I would say overall is that um, keeping all of this in mind, my emphasis as a parent and my advice is to have that connection right now over discipline, um, relax some rules, and to really try to spend that time with your children if things aren't going well, connecting with them and getting to what the underlying feeling is and addressing that feeling. Um, rather than engaging in a lot of um, punishment. Now, of course, there are some behaviors that, that need to be appropriately disciplined. I'm not saying we throw discipline out the window. I'm just saying this is a time when, it, you know, we always as parents are making a choice. Do, are, you know, are they really upset? Do they really need me to care for them? Or they do, do they need limit and discipline right now? Um, and sometimes those two things, those behaviors look very much alike and you don't know which one to choose. What I'm saying is in this particular time frame you should probably go with a connection over, you know, and expecting them um, to have those good behaviors. You should go with being connected over the discipline. Assume that they are hurting rather than assuming that they're being manipulative and respond in that way. So there, at the beginning of this, there was a lot of, you know, color-coded schedules and, you know, on and on and on. Um, thinking that the kids should get new toys and people having color-coded, you know, charts of 15-minute increments and lots of schoolwork and we shouldn't do screen time. And what our kids actually really need right now is to connect with us, to feel loved, to feel safe. They need some quality time. They need hugs. That's really what they need. They don't need the toys. They can have the screens, believe me. We're going to talk about that more. Um, but you know, it is okay also for them to be on screens during this time. It's, it's healthy and adaptive. So what we want to do in order to kind of build up that resilience for the kids is to, one thing that's really good is to label their feelings. So if they, if you've got a kid who's especially cranky, you know, you might say, it seems to me like you're feeling really frustrated and then let them talk, but label those feelings. You seem sad. Are you feeling sad? That kind of thing. And open up that conversation about emotions. Obviously, you want to limit information about what's going on because they don't need all of that. Um, in fact, it's probably good to limit a lot of it for yourself. So, and then give them some outlets to express their feelings and express their emotions. Have them, um, they really need to connect with you as we've talked about. I think chores, chores are great for kids right now. There's a lot of work to be done at home because everybody's at home all the time. And um, it's very hard to teach a kid to do chores, because especially if you're a busy working parent, because it takes more time to teach them and then you have to often redo it um, than it does to just do it yourself. So a lot of parents have said, oh, just go play, I'll do it, I'll do it myself. This is the time because they need to build those skills and you need help. So even though it's going to be a little bit challenging in the beginning. It's still a really good thing to do if you can do it. Um, is to teach some of those chores. Um, up their ante a little bit. Um, give them plenty of outlets for creativity. I know um, for my daughter, she really feels a lot better if we do some baking together. That's been her passion during the pandemic is doing some gluten-free baking. And um, it helps her. She does something creative, she does something expressive, and we do it together. And so it's that connection piece. 
Um, my son has been very different. Um, he wants to spend a little bit more time alone, but, um, but he's doing a lot of his own creativity work too. And so that really helps get out some of those feelings. And like I said, we want to model being emotionally resilient, not saying we don't have these feelings, but actually talking about our feelings and how we cope with them. Some of the resources that I really like, both for my own kids and for my patients who are struggling with any of these symptoms, anxiety, behavior, depression, um, are GoZen, which is a fantastic online program. It teaches cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, where you actually figure out which of your thoughts are, are accurately reflecting the world and which of them are just feeding into your emotions and, and are helping you. Um, and they have an online program and they have a free trial available for 30 days. Um, they have a bunch of modules, some on being resilient, some on being anxious. Um, they have some um, mindfulness meditation and all of that is really helpful for kids. Um, the other thing is, um, the meditation can, is very, very helpful. It actually activates the frontal lobes and calms down the amygdala. So it's very helpful and it's a great thing for kids to learn at a young age if it's possible um, and get into the habit of taking some deep breaths. Um, one thing that you can do, you know, to build it into the day and start really small is when kids are washing their hands, you know, that 20 seconds, you can do the deep breaths during that time. So have them just focus on just washing your, the hands, not singing a song, just paying attention to their breathing during that time. And that just gets you more grounded in your physical state. Um, there's lots of ways to meditate online. GoZen has some things. The Calm app, which is great for adults, has some kid programs on it. But um, probably my favorite is the Cosmic Kids Yoga. It's a YouTube channel and an app. And they have yoga and they also have some mindfulness meditations, which are really, really good. Um, one thing that you can find easily on YouTube is something called the flip the lid, the hand model of the brain. This is your deep center of the brain, your amygdala, and these are your frontal lobes. And when you flip out, you're called it flipping your lid. So the question is, who do you want to be in charge? Um, using that model and showing them, it shows them the parts of the brain, it helps them understand, and it actually helps them gain some control. The other thing, um, these books you can get off Amazon or pretty much anywhere, are the what to do books and their emotional books. So the what to do when you're um, when you worry too much is a big one. It's kind of a workbook you can go through. Um, what to do when you're mad all the time. Um, those books I think can be really helpful. Just little workbooks you can go through with your kid. Appropriate starting around the age of probably four or five, but they would be even better for older kids up to yeah, definitely up to ten or twelve. That's the hand model of the brain, and it kind of is good to talk to kids about brains because it actually is a way to kind of help them um, overcome a challenge by putting it in brain terms. So if they're really struggling with something new, instead of saying to them, oh, you're fine, you're, you can do this, keep going, you say, it's really tough. Your brain is making brand new connections right now, and that is hard to do, and it takes a lot of work, and you have to try a bunch of times to make those connections. That's more effective in kids. So in order to model this, we need to have the resilience ourselves. And like I said, this is more than just the normal self-care, um, just letting off some steam. This is really about expanding your capacity emotionally right now. So meditation and prayer are really good. Um, they've been shown in many studies to um, help build up those resilient skills to calm your brain down. Meditation has been shown to build up the frontal lobes, so it's a fantastic thing to do. The other thing um, that is very good for adults to do is something called coaching yourself through a crisis. So you can think about this in two different ways. One of the things you can do is think about if you were um, talking to yourself as a friend, if you were, you know, your best friend and you called yourself on the phone and you said, I'm really struggling with this and this and this, and then what advice would you give your friend? And just that little bit of distancing yourself psychologically often gives you the answer. You're not so caught up in the moment. It takes you out of it and makes you think about it from the outsider's point of view. And that can often help you with a solution. The other way to do that distancing is temporal distancing, which means thinking about if it were six months from now, or a year from now, or two years from now, and you're looking back on this time, what would you like to say about how you handled this situation? 
about how you, what did you do? How did you spend your time? What did you do at work? What did you do with your home? What did you do with yourself? What did you do with your children? Think about it from a future point of view. That kind of distancing can really help come up with some good solutions to problems that you're facing. Um, another thing, and this I got from Brene Brown, who has a wonderful, um, many books, um, a Netflix special. Um, she is a, um, a researcher and a social worker. Um, the advice I got from her is what we call the family gap plan. Um, so what she says is basically there are times that everybody has like a battery level. So um, her story is that she used to travel a lot for work. When she would come home, um, she was exhausted from the trip and she was at like 20% battery. The problem was her husband who had been with the kids and working was also at 20% battery. So they realized that they had a big gap because 20 plus 20 does not equal 100 and you need to have 100 in order to make a family run. So we started talking in our family about our battery level. And so it was really helpful in the sense that, you know, our kids, we could, I could communicate with my husband about it and I could say, I am at 8%, I've got to do something to recharge. And he would say, I'm at a good 60%, so you go and you do your thing. And then the next time he's like, I am just worn out. I'm like, I'm good. I'm, this is my percentage. You can go and get your battery levels up. And our kids have done it too. They've said to us, you know, and there have been days that we've completely skipped homeschooling because, you know, a child said that their battery level was just too low to do it. And I think we avoided some meltdowns and some behavior problems that way. Um, so it's something that I do encourage. I really like um, both the Calm app for the meditation and they have some bedtime stories and they have some kid focused stuff, but I think that they, they do a really good job instructing mindfulness meditation for someone who's new to it. And there's a wonderful podcast called The Happiness Lab. It's also also on YouTube. Um, it is Dr. Lori Santos is a professor of psychology at Yale. She offered a course on happiness to her students and became the number one class um, with a, over a thousand people in the class. They had to rent out the, they had to use the auditorium um, at the university for it rather than just a regular classroom because so many people signed up for the class. And um, she's turned it into a podcast and she's also filmed all of her, um, all of her lectures on YouTube. And it's really great for just kind of self-care skills. She's doing a lot on the pandemic right now um, about how to handle, you know, social media in a pandemic, how to handle screens in a pandemic. She's got some really good stuff. I think it's really good to think right now about the things that we can control and the things that we cannot control. Um, we cannot control whether the, the level of virus in our community. We cannot control if our hospitals are ready for it. We cannot control if things are opening up or not. We cannot control if other people wear masks or if um, they want you to wear a mask. We cannot control the amount of toilet paper, which is still out, or if the grocery store is still out of things. Um, and we can't control how summer camps and schools and works are going to reopen. Um, what we can control is, you know, limiting kind of that access to social media and news. Um, you can do your own, you can control your own social distancing. You can control your own compassion for yourself and for your children and for people outside. You can control um, your attitude and your gratitude and finding fun things to do at home. And when we focus on what we can control, it's a lot more helpful to us, and it's really helpful to the kids as well, teaching that. Okay, so um, one piece of medical advice that I know I won't be following in these times, and it is the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines on screen time, which you remember for school-aged children is no more than two hours a day in front of a screen, ha, ha, ha. Um, that does not work right now not when distance learning is happening, not when parents are needing to work, not when kids are home all the time. Um, it does not work. So good news is that the American Academy of Pediatrics has revised their guidelines on screen time for the pandemic. And I think that they have made some, you know, they understand there's gonna be a lot more screens. And a lot of those screens are necessary and good. Connecting with friends, doing schoolwork, that is necessary. Um, it's also necessary babysitting for working parents sometimes. It's what you have to do. Um, what they are asking for is for kids to spend four hours a day not on screens. That doesn't seem, that, that, that can actually be kind of hard to do if really the whole day is spent on screens. Um, one thing that they say to do is try not to have screens at meals or in bedrooms 
They didn't mention bathrooms, but I will mention bathrooms because the first week there were some screens that went into the bathrooms, some iPads that went in there. Um, monitor the content, that's appropriate. And remember that not all screens, but not all particular shows have the same, you know, impact on, on them. So um, you can have some candy and you can have some nutritious food. So, you know, the school and the nature documentaries, which I make my poor kids watch, um, those are, you know, the, the meat and vegetables. But, you know, my son gets to watch The Simpsons every day and that's his candy. And so think about it in that sort of way. Um, you really just, the guidelines have been relaxed, but you wanna make sure the kids still get exercise and that the screens don't interfere with their relationship with their family or with their sleep. And so that's what's really important to think about when it comes to this. Um, make time every day for some family activities and connections. It's hard to do, but um, especially when everybody's working, but you don't need to do it for that much time for it to have meaning. And one thing that's really, I think, helpful is that, you know, start the day strong and end the day strong. And the middle can be really mushy, but usually you'll remember what the first thing you did and the last thing you did as you're going to sleep. And so give, try to, if you have attention, give kids attention at those times the best that you can. So overall, the tips are understand the trauma, let the feelings happen and talk about them and reflect with them. Find out what kids know and correct any misinformation. Don't make any promises because we don't know what's happening in the future. Um, find out what their specific worries are. Are they realistic? Do they have some misinformation in there? Because kids often fill in things that they don't understand um, with a lot of misinformation. For you, focus on what you can control and help your child focus on what they can control. Lots of compassion, use resilience techniques and directly teach those coping skills. So one thing to realize is that some days doing the best that we can may still really fall short of what we'd like to do, but life isn't perfect on any front and doing what we can with what we have is the most we should expect of ourselves or anyone else. Mr. Rogers, who doesn't love Mr. Rogers. So remember to have compassion for yourself and others. This is all too much. We just have to do the best we can. Then the last thing I wanna mention is um, they've recently added a sixth stage of grief which is meaning. So how can you find meaning in what is happening? Um, you know, Mr. Rogers said, look to the helpers, look to the people who are helping, show those, show those acts of heroism, and that's wonderful. Um, but also think about what meaning, like how has this changed your family? Where can you find meaning in what is happening in how your life has changed? What lessons do you wanna take from this pandemic moving forward? So um, if anyone needs, um, you know, some extra help. If you're listening to this and realizing this has been going on too long or you think your child might be depressed or anxious, um, therapy is really, really helpful. But don't wait too long, you know, especially right now when the stress levels are high, it can be really helpful to get therapy and um, insurance companies are really allowing that therapy to happen over telehealth right now, which is helpful to everybody. Early intervention really is key for kids to change their thought patterns, to be more um, adaptive and pro-social as opposed to, you know, bad thought patterns that are going to get them in trouble. You can go to um, a licensed mental health counselor, a licensed psychologist. Psychiatrists are the medical doctors who prescribe medication. Psychologists are the PhD level doctors who work directly and do more therapy. Um, you can get referrals from your pediatrician or from your hematologist. They often know of really good people in your area. And if you can't get referrals from those folks, oh, you could also get it from your school. They, schools often have referrals. Um, and you can, the APA has a psychologist locator, which I've listed there. Of course, if anything is, you know, if, you, if your child is having suicidal thoughts or self-harm or anything really bad, you can always, the thing to do is to actually call 911 or take your child to the ER. That's the thing to do in an emergency. Um, but hopefully, you know, doing some of that therapy will prevent us from getting to that point. But I just want you to know what the, the backup plan is. And that is all that I have today. So thank you guys so much. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Dr. Bloom. I actually did receive a question as, um, the, as the presentation was going on. Um, so how do we summarize these concepts that you shared? And, um, work with a parental partner who perhaps isn't on the same page during this crazy time? 
So the good news about this is that generally the connection and so forth um, is something that can really be very impactful for kids with just one parent doing it, okay? So kids really just need to have that connection with one person. Of course, it's an ideal situation you would have both parents and everyone living in the house being on the same page. Um, and so that can be helpful. So one thing is that, you know, you can encourage that person to watch this because we're going to, it's going to be up on social media, right? Yeah. Um, but in general, you can, if you wanted to just kind of summarize it, what I would go out and I would say to my spouse would be, um, the brains are traumatized and, you know, everybody is feeling very, very stressed. And the right thing to do right now is actually to just focus on being connected to our kid rather than to be doing, assuming that the child's manipulating and needs um, discipline right now. So let's just focus on having more connection and then a lot of the behavior problems actually fade away. So that would be kind of my one sentence summary for, you know, if I were bringing it to a spouse. Is that what you needed? I think that's a, I, I think, yep, that's exactly what they were interested in. Wonderful. Okay. Um, lots of great feedback on the chat. Is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? Your lines are unmuted. You have the ability to unmute your line and ask your question directly to Dr. Bloom, or you can always feel free to utilize our chat or Q&A at the bottom of your um, screen. And we'll give all the participants just a few moments. And I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Bloom, for hanging on through a power outage. And um, yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, you handled it with such grace. So um, we really appreciate you kicking back on with us and um, continuing the presentation. So is there anyone okay. who would like to ask any questions, concerns you'd like to share? Um, yeah, can I ask a question, Carrie? Of course. Um, so I was, I was curious, you were, you were talking about, you know, Zoom fatigue and how um, we're, we're not needing to be on this and how this is a new skill. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if you had any advice for, um, so I have a five-year-old, so he, he is at home with me um, and he's Zooming in with his preschool. So he sees me all the time on Zoom because when I'm on it, I'm ru running the meeting and I'm touching all the different things. So when he goes on his stuff, he tries to like kind of model what I'm doing and we have to keep reminding him like, no, 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 like that's not how, <laughs> you, know, you don't mute and unmute, you don't do, I mean, he's learned how to do all the things. <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure if there was any advice that you had kind of in that, like, because there's not experience with this, right? We've never needed to have five-year-olds learn how to do circle time via a screen when and with so many buttons that can be touched but shouldn't be touched and then they should be when they want to answer and they want to unmute them and it, it's a little bit much i think it's a little bit much for you know a lot of the the, the parents it's a little bit much for a lot of the adults um you know so i, I think that my advice would be um remind him that the rules are the same as at school so, um, and try to set up like a, a symbol of him going to school, which is very, very hard to do. Um, but, you know, for the first week or two, I actually started the day with the kids by um, doing the pledge and their school motto, which they had said every day. And I was like, this is school time because the kids have been doing that. You know, he's been doing that for a long time, right? And that put him in the mind of, okay, now I am a student. Um, you know, anything you can do to kind of remind him, okay, this is you being a student right now. Mommy's a teacher when she's on Zoom. You are a student when you're on Zoom. You're not like mommy. Um, and putting it in that way. And then if you can participate with him and kind of model exactly what behavior he should be doing, if you can. But if that's, you can't, that's part I of my problem is that I'm, I'm leaving from one and, and like, and sometimes his older brother was even locking him on and then I'm going back to, to work and teaching my classes and yeah, so we're definitely, it gets really loose, right? Like my kids are in a different place every day. Um, sometimes they're in the kitchen, sometimes they're outside, you know, some today that we had a leak in our house, so they were in their bedroom. I mean, it, it's, it can be really loose. And, but if he's having trouble kind of sticking with those norms, you might want to even have him be on the living room rug and put the zoom up on the coffee table and you are in circle time right now kind of situation. Um, anything you can do to kind of cue him that, that 
it's that behavior. But honestly, I mean, it's really hard. I mean, I think of a five-year-old, we're asking an, an awful lot um, for them to be participating in these Zoom meetings. I will tell you that, um, you know, I have one kid who's done very well of it and one kid who absolutely refuses to do it. And at some point I just had to email the teacher and say, We're, we can't do this right now. I can't fight this battle. This one isn't worth fighting. And the teacher was very understanding. So, um, you know, that's the kind of thing where I'm saying, you know, have compassion and grace <laughs> and don't worry about it too much if it doesn't work out. Does that work? Okay. Thank you. Because some of these things I feel like, um, the likelihood is that this is going to be a long-term skill that all of our kids are gonna to need to have. Like the likelihood that like Zoom just completely disappears or the equivalent, you know, is, um, yeah, I don't know. But thank you, um, the session's been really great. I appreciate it. Good, I'm glad. Uh, and yes, it might be a long-term skill, but it's, that's <laughs> also, it's okay if he doesn't master that at five. Zoom might be a long-term <laughs> skill that's more appropriate for him to master. I mean, seriously, I mean, the difference between my eight-year-old and my 10-year-old is, is huge. So I don't know that a five-year-old really can do this. Yeah. There's a um, school district that when they try and have them and start kindergarten that way in the <laughs> on some kind of Google Classroom I thing. I know. Yeah. I Dr. Can, Bloom, I had a question texted to me. Um, okay. So I wanted to share this with you. So you mentioned that when in doubt, um, opt for making connections with your children. Do you have any suggestions for working with teachers who may not be in agreement with that approach and are pressing hard on completing the work and submitting it? This is where we have to have compassion for our poor teachers. Um, one of the things that, that somebody mentioned to me, uh, I think a lot of parents are really feeling that pressure from the teachers. One of the things that a, that a parent mentioned to me um, that I hadn't thought about was that the teachers are scared of losing their jobs and they're trying to prove right now that they are valuable and that um, they are doing something when they're really not doing what they were doing before at all. And the parents have, have certainly they're providing some academics, um, providing some structure for parents to use, but you know that day in, day out, they can't be there. They can't do that. Um, so the one thing I, so I think that the teachers are very stressed and I think a teacher who's being very much like, no, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. I think that's where you come in and say, you know, you come, the negotiating position I would come from is saying, my kid is really struggling emotionally right now. Can you help me? And I think that if you go in and you have that kind of approach, then um, that opens the conversation a lot more than like, why are you doing it this way? Um, this is not working for my kid. Because um, remember, the teachers are feeling very attacked on all levels. Um, and they're worried about what this is all gonna mean. So that would be the approach that I would take. When I have taken that approach with teachers, um, as, as a professional and as a parent, it has been much more effective. You know, my kid's really sad. My kid, I can tell my kid's feeling really depressed um, and really struggling with this. You know, you say these things to the teacher, then they want to help as opposed to defend themselves. That would be my general advice, but it's hard. It's really hard. And sometimes you might just say, mm, this isn't happening. I'm putting my kids' mental health above the academics right now. And, and I applaud you for that. I don't know if the teacher will, but I do. Um, there was another question that came through. Um, for someone about the age seven, so a first, second grader, how much time should they really be spending on online education? Or would you recommend? I think it depends on your child's tolerance. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't think that it would be much possible to do more than an hour or two, honestly, um, you know, to actually be online. And if you can get that, I think that's good. Um, my second grader does not, has just pretty much refused to do anything online anymore. Um, and Luckily, we've been okay with that. The teacher's been supportive of that. I mean, to the point that we had videos posted that were lessons and she refused to watch them. And so I had to watch them and take photos of the screen and then teach her the material myself. But, you know, I've got a strong willed one there. Um, and it wasn't worth the fight for me to do it. So um, the amount of, I mean, generally they say homeschooling should only be about two to three hours a day. And so um, I don't think anybody's getting content that's much more than that. Um, unless they're spending a lot of time in Zoom meetings, just kind of sitting there waiting. 
Um, I think some some classes have been like that. So um, I don't. I think you know really you can make it the absolute minimum. I think is absolutely fine right now. The learning brain is not what's activated right now, and kids learn an incredible amount through play. So um, you know if it's a situation where you know they can participate in something and they like participating in it, I would certainly do that. If they're resistant to it or they just get zoned out doing it after a while, then I would move on to another activity and I, I would let them play because they're learning an incredible amount through their playing. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I actually had a question. Um, I found that my son's school isn't necessarily doing those face to face. They're not having those connections whatsoever. How would you recommend I address a concern such as that? Because here where I live, we still have a month of school left. Yeah. Yeah. So you're wanting your son to have more connection? Yeah, there's, he essentially has busy work. He logs in and does work for a couple hours and does not have something like this, for example, no real online education. Yeah. And, and I'm going to get back to that question, but one thing I want to mention, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this, is that this distance learning is not traditional homeschool and it's not online school. This is regular school that has been in an emergency transferred to a virtual platform. And real homeschooling is not like this and real virtual school, you know, there is, a, there is curriculum that has been designed for doing on a computer and doing virtually and this is not it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just from an education perspective, I, I want you to know that. Um, yeah, the busy work. So some kids really like that, but it does leave them without a lot of social connection. So one thing that, um, so for my daughter who refused to do her Zoom meetings for a period of time, this is the last week, so we're making her do it to finish strong this week. Um, I did schedule one-on-ones with a teacher with her. So we would have a Zoom meeting one-on-one, -on -one, and that way, like if she was doing a project, she could tell her teacher about the project and just have some face-to-face -face time with her teacher because, you know, the little ones are so connected with their teachers. They're like another parent, and they really miss them if they don't get to talk to them. For the older ones, um, one th you can do that one-on-one -on -one thing too, which can be really helpful. Um, even if they're just having a conversation about the project, you know, sharing information or um, just asking questions or just talking about their lives. Um, the other thing is that some teachers have set up a lunch bunch, so they kind of host a Zoom meeting where they just have, you know, time for the kids to chat. And the, the, the teachers aren't even really there. The, they're kind of maybe listening in supervising but the kids are getting a chance to talk to one another and have lunch together and that's something my son really looks forward to he does that once a week and he really really likes that um it's a little messy because it's a, like a bunch of kids who are not on mute but yeah. i think they'll take it because they like seeing their friends faces and asking questions and talking to them a little bit does that help yes that's a great answer thank you so much are there any other questions for dr bloom All right, well, I'd just like to um, give another shout out to Dr. Bloom for your grace and resilience through a power outage tonight. We really appreciate your time and attention to this. And I just also wanted to remind everyone who's in attendance tonight that the next webinar in this series, A Whole New World Parenting and a Pandemic, will be Thursday, May 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, next week's focus will be on parenting those adolescents and um, we will be posting this link to this recorded webinar shortly um, on our social media page. So be on the lookout to be able to share this information about the series with other parents who could use support through these uncertain times. Um, thanks again, Dr. Bloom, for that very insightful presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us at hfaprograms at hemophiliafed.org. Um, and have a wonderful evening, all. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great night. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.